That indeed is a wonderful song, uh, In Christ Alone. One of the great privileges that we have as Christians is that we have union with Christ, that we're in Christ. And that relationship is far greater and far superior than if Jesus Christ was with us right now here on earth and we walked with him. The fact that he is in us and that we are in him is a far greater relationship than even if Jesus was present with us here on earth and walked with us. I'm going to ask that you take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. I'm not going to ask you to stand, but I do trust that you are standing in your hearts as we read the Word of God. And I want to read Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. There are a few verses that we will not read, and that will be explained a little bit later. But Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 21, it says, And when Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered about him, and he stayed by the seashore. And one of the synagogue officials, named Jairus, came up and upon seeing him, fell at his feet and entreated Jesus earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her that she may get well and live. And he, Jesus, went off with him. And a great multitude was following him and pressing in on him. Then I want to jump to verse 35. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official, saying, Your daughter has died. Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the synagogue official, and he beheld a commotion, and people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died but is asleep. And they began laughing at him. But putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions. And they entered the room where the child was. And taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Pum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately, the girl arose and began to walk, for she was 12 years old, and immediately they were completely astonished. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this, and he said that something should be given to her to eat. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the wonderful amazing, magnificent, marvelous word that comes from you. And that we are privileged and that we are blessed to have in our hands. Thank you that your word is truth. Thank you that your word is eternal and that your word is forever. Thank you that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And we come now, Father, to ask that you would speak to each and every one of us through your word uh, so that you, we can be the people that you have called us to be. Father, would you be gracious to us and kind to us to see the marvelous things that are in your word? Would it feed our soul? Will it cause us to grow and mature and to be more like Jesus Christ? Thank you for your word. And help us never, ever to take it for granted. But instead, help us 
to let it dwell in us richly. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for this opportunity we have to proclaim it. Please use it as you see fit. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The Gospel of Mark presents us with a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. I said it before, but the book begins by declaring the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark wants us to know that Jesus possesses supreme authority. He has authority to call men to follow him. Jesus has authority to tell men, leave your professions, leave your families, and come and follow me. Jesus teaches with authority. He has authority. He has authority to silence a demon and to cast a demon out. He has the authority to heal a leper. He has the authority to say to a paralytic man, today your sins are forgiven. He has authority to send out his disciples and to tell them to preach and to heal and cast out demons. He can give his disciples that kind of authority. Another way to put it is that Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. He's the one who possesses authority, yes, but he is the one who is the Lord. And in Mark, at the very end of chapter 2, it is declared that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. But we've been seeing lately in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 4 and chapter 5 that Jesus is the Lord of the wind and the waves. He can speak to the storm. He can speak to the waves. He can speak to the wind and say, peace, be still. He has that kind of authority. We saw last Lord's Day that he has authority over demons. He is Lord over a legion of demons. And he can cast demons out and tell those demons where they are to go. Today in our passage, we learn that Jesus is the Lord over death. Paul describes death as our enemy, our last enemy. Our text says that Jesus is the Lord even over death. And even though death is still a reality in the world in which we live, one day our last enemy, death, will be abolished. But we, in the meantime, while we're still living, we need to keep in mind that the one that we have believed in, the one that we have put our trust and our faith in, that that one is the Lord over death. And that's clearly demonstrated in our text. Our text is the slices of bread. The slices of bread that make up the contents of chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. I call it the slices of bread because the meat we won't look at. When Jesus deals with this woman who has a hemorrhage for 12 years, that's found right in the middle of the slices of bread. Now, hopefully you understand the slices of bread are just as good as the meat. So no way are we trying to say that the slices of bread you can do away with. It is just interesting that when Mark writes, there are times he presents biblical truth as a sandwich. 
where there are the slices of bread and in between that is the meat. And so today we want to look at the slices of bread. The first slice is found in verses 21 through 24, and then the second slice is found in verses 35 through 43. But as we look at the slices of bread, I want us to do so from the subject, the Lord over death. I want to impress upon our minds that our Savior, that our Lord, our Master, is the Lord over death. Please note that in verses 21 through 24, the Lord over death encounters a helpless man. The one who is Lord over death encounters a man who is helpless. The, the setting of that encounter is given in verse 21. And it's a familiar setting because as we've been looking at the end of Mark 4 and also at the beginning of Mark 5, we see Jesus and his disciples in a boat crossing over the Sea of Galilee to get to one location. And once at, they're at that location, they get back in the boat and come back to where they had departed. And so Jesus had been in the country of the Gerizims, and there he cast out legion, that is, multitudes of demons out of a man. The response of the people to that casting out of the demons is that they wanted Jesus to leave their area. They wanted Jesus to get out. They didn't want to have anything at all to do with Jesus. So Jesus and his disciples get in the boat, and they head back and cross over the Sea of Galilee and end up more than likely, likely in Capernaum. We are introduced in verses 22 and 23 to the helpless man. We find that his name is Jairus. He's a synagogue official. To put it another way, he's a big wig. He's well respected. He's dignified. He's known by the religious community. He has a central role in the synagogue because the synagogue was a place of instruction, the place of prayer for the Jewish people. And this synagogue official had the responsibility of kind of conducting or organizing the order of service in the synagogue. He would be the one who identified the teacher, what the service would look like. He was responsible physically for the synagogue and financially for the synagogue. He's a Jew. He's well respected. We'll learn a little bit later on that he's married. He has a daughter. But what the text lets us know about him, most of all, particularly in these verses, is that he is helpless. And his helplessness is revealed when Mark says that this synagogue official came to Jesus, fell at his feet, and pleaded with Jesus. These acts shows his helplessness. First of all, he comes to Jesus. Even though Jesus is surrounded by a crowd, even though Jesus is by the sea, there are many people there. Somehow, some way, this synagogue official, probably because of his respect, is able to get to Jesus. And when he gets to Jesus, when he sees him, he falls at his feet. This is not an act of worship, but an act of acknowledgement. He is acknowledging the fact that Jesus is superior to him. That Jesus is superior to this synagogue official. And, and what's amazing here is that not all Jewish people 
in religious Jewish people were opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is a Jewish man who comes to Jesus and he bows down at the feet of Jesus. But his helplessness is demonstrated and shown when he begins to plead with Jesus, when he begins to beg Jesus, when he begins to cry out to Jesus, and he says to Jesus, my little daughter is at the point of death. No doubt his heart is broken. No doubt he says tenderly, my little daughter, Jesus. Even though she's 12 years old, and in Jewish culture, she's ready to become a woman. In Jewish culture, you could have girls who were 12, 13, 14 entering into marriage. But this father is not saying she's small in stature. He's saying that she's precious to me. She's tender to me. Jesus, my little girl. And he explains the condition of his little girl. He said, my little girl is at the point of death. She's getting ready to die, Jesus. She's terminal. The doctors have not given her much time. The doctors realize that it's just a matter of hours or days that she is going to die. This young life has come to the end of her life. And this man is not able to do anything. He's not able to use his status, his position, his money to make a difference in his daughter's life. No doubt he has spent money and had doctors come and look at her condition. He's tried everything. He's tried religion. His religion can't help him. Here is a synagogue official and leads the synagogue to come to Jesus. And he is distraught. He is broken. He is helpless. And he pleads with Jesus. And he says, Jesus, my little girl. And if you're a parent, you can relate to that. My daughter is 34 years old. And my wife still calls her baby girl. 34 years old. And sometimes we do that with our kids. Parents, out of our love and our tenderness and our affection for our kids, we will refer to them. My little child, my child, my baby. And that's what this synagogue official is doing. He's crying out. He says, Jesus, she's going to die. She's terminal. The doctors can't do anything. I can't do anything. My religion can't do anything. But I come to you because I believe you can do something. And so he requests Jesus. He says to Jesus, come. It is come to my house where she is in Place your hands on her. In other words, Jesus, come and heal her so that she might live and be well. This man is helpless. And he comes to Jesus. He falls down at Jesus' feet. And from a broken heart, he cries out to Jesus and says, come and heal my daughter. Come that she may get well and live. And our Lord, in verse 24, doesn't respond with words. He doesn't respond with a dialogue. He simply goes and departs with Jairus to his home. 
And Mark adds the note that really serves as the setting for verses 25 through 33. He adds the note that there was a great multitude that was following Jesus and pressing in on him. So Jesus not only goes with Jairus to Jairus' house, but this great multitude, they decide to follow too. And it's not as if they're practicing social distancing. <laughs> they're not doing that at all. They're pressing in on Jesus so that they're rubbing against Jesus. And that becomes the setting for when Jesus asks the amazing question, who touched the hem of my garment? But we will look at that at a later time. What we want to do now is skip to verses 35. And we want to note, after jumping over those verses, that the Lord over death encourages the devastated, helpless man. Yes, Jairus is helpless. But it's going to get worse. He's going to become devastated. He's going to become defeated. He's going to become discouraged. He's going to become deflated. Here's a man who has come to Jesus and said, Jesus, come lay your hands on my daughter. And Jesus responds by doing that. But as Jesus goes to his house, he gets sidetracked. He gets delayed. He cannot just focus solely on Jairus' daughter. He focuses on another woman who has a problem. And so finally, when Jesus says his words to that woman, when he says to her, go in peace and be healed of your affliction, when he says those words immediately, while those words are coming out of his mouth, we read that there are some messengers that come from the house of Jairus. And they come to Jairus with some devastating news, with some bad news. They say to him, your daughter has died. Your daughter, the one that you love, the one that you have affection for, your, your only daughter, she has died. And I'm sure that must have deflated Jairus. To, to hear that his greatest fear has come true. The, the fact that he wanted Jesus to come and heal his daughter. That Jesus delayed in going, ministered to someone else. And as they get ready to go on to Jairus' house, the news comes. Your daughter has died. The one whom you love, she's dead. She's no longer at the brink of death. She's no longer on the verge of death. She has entered into the reality of death. And she is dead. And so no longer is this man just helpless. This man is devastated. When the news of, the, of a loved one comes to you, that your loved one has died, that is painful, that is hurtful, that is devastating. Not only did they come with that news, but they asked Jairus a question. Why trouble the teacher anymore? They referred to Jesus as the teacher. You went to get him to try to heal your daughter, but your daughter's dead. So, so don't trouble the Lord Jesus Christ anymore. Don't annoy him. Don't bother him. There's no need for him to continue to your house. That's their perspective. <laughs> but the perspective of Jesus is radically different. It's a breath of fresh air. 
Jesus says to Jairus in verse 36, having overheard what the messenger said, Jesus said to them, do not be afraid any longer, Jairus. Stop being afraid. I know that you are afraid that this would happen. But Jesus says, stop being afraid. I know the reality of her death has devastated, but stop being afraid. And he tells him, believe. Only believe. Put your fear out of your life and believe. That is, continue believing. You, you came to me earlier, and you bow down on my feet. You pleaded with me. You believe that if I would come and lay my hand on your daughter, that she would get well and live. That faith that led you to do that, Jairus, make sure you continue with that kind of faith. Don't stop believing. Don't stop trusting. Don't stop putting your faith and your confidence in me, Jairus. So Jesus encourages this devastated, helpless man. He tells him, do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. He doesn't tell him what to believe. The implication is believe what you've been believing when you came to me. The words of the messengers are bad theological advice. They said to this man, why trouble the teacher anymore? That's bad theological advice. When your world crumbles, when, when all seems hopeless, when you're devastated, when the worst thing that could happen has happened, that is not a time to heed the advice of these men who say, don't trouble the teacher. Don't trouble the Lord. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Don't ever believe that when you are in your worst circumstances, that it is a bother, that it is a trouble, that Jesus is annoyed if you were to dare to come to him. He's being told, leave Jesus. Leave him alone. Don't bother him. Don't bring him to your house. And what they should have been saying, listen to what he says. Do as he tells you. You don't want to follow those words in times of trouble. <laughs> we need Jesus. Even when things are good, we need Jesus. Isn't that why we sung this song? We did it kind of a unique way, but we sung the song, I need thee every hour. That, that's the song that we have to be singing in our hearts, that we need Jesus every moment, every second, every hour of my life. I need thee, O Lord. I need thee. And I come to thee. I hope none of us ever has the idea that we don't need Jesus. And that we never look at our Lord as one who says, don't trouble me. Don't bother me. Don't come to me. In your greatest problems and difficulties of life, understand that Jesus wants you to come to him. He wants you to fall at his feet and to cry out what you need the Lord to do.
as the narrative continues. In verses 37 through 40, we see that the Lord over death gets rid of the crowds of people. Jesus is about to do a wonderful miracle, but he's not going to do it in the midst of everyone. He's not some kind of circus performer. He's not an entertainer. He's not an amusement park. And so Jesus has to get rid of some people. He's not going to let all see the miracle. So first of all, Jesus gets rid of the curious crowd. That crowd has been with him by the Sea of Galilee. That crowd that rubbed against Jesus as he ministered to the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. Jesus forbids them. He won't allow them to follow him. He says in that verse, not he said, but the text says, he allowed no one to follow him. He is a great crowd. He's popular. Surely he will want to do this miracle in front of everybody. But no, he gets rid of the curious crowd. He forbids them. He says, no one, not a one of you, are permitted to follow me. The only ones that he permits to follow and to go on with him are his Jairus. And it's also his three disciples. Peter, James, and John. Those three disciples that will be kind, become the inner circle of disciples. Those three disciples who will witness the, the transfiguration of Jesus and will be pretty much in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. He says to all the other ones, be gone. I, I, I won't permit you. This, this mass of people who are rubbing against him, who are following him, you're not privy to what I'm about to do. And so he forbids them. He forbids them in verse 37 for coming. And then there's another crowd he has to deal with. When he gets to the house, he doesn't even get into the house. When he gets to the house, there's another crowd. And this is the crowd of mourners. <laughs> These are the individuals who are causing a commotion. As Jesus says, he sees them, and he sees a commotion. He sees almost a bunch of people weeping and crying, but not for the good, but to such an extent that it seems like a riot is taking place, that chaos is, has broken out. These people who are trying to express deep grief over the death of Jairus' daughter. Jesus sees him simply as causing a commotion. He sees him as continually weeping and wailing. You see, in Jewish culture, when someone died, it was expected of you to have professional mourners. It was expected of you to have a lease one person who was responsible for wailing and for weeping and crying out loud. Then you're supposed to have two other individuals who would play sad music on their flute. Well, here's a respected man, a synagogue official, and his house is loaded with those who are mourning. And again, Jesus is outside of the house. And they're coming to the house and they see all that is taking place, this commotion. He sees all of these people weeping. <laughs> and he enters into the house and he says to them, Why make a commotion and weep? Now, that has to be an interesting question. They must have thought to themselves, what, what do you mean, why make a commotion and weep? Jairus' daughter, who was 12 years old, she's dead. So, so why are you asking us that question? And to make matters even worse, Jesus really shocks him by making a statement. 
he says to them, the child has not died, but is asleep. And they just burst out laughing. They burst out ridiculing him and scorning him. What do you mean the child is not dead? We seen the coroner come in and officially pronounce the child as dead. We seen it flat her flat line. That there is no more pulse. There is no more heartbeat. We sent messengers to you, Jesus. We sent messengers to Jairus to let him know she's dead. She's dead as a doorknob. There is no life in her. And you are going to say to us, why the commotion? You're going to say to us that she's just sleeping? And they just laughed at him. They wanted to put him to shame for making a laughable statement like that. But they didn't understand. They didn't understand what Jesus was saying. Yes, he knew that she was dead. But what he was trying to say, he said that she was asleep, that her death is temporary, that her death is not going to last. And so as they're laughing, remember these are the professional mourners, the weepers. They, they, they had tears flooding out of their eyes. They, they were wailing and weeping. They were playing sad songs, but now they're laughing at a funeral, so to speak. It shows how hypocritical their mourning was. <laughs> the mourning turned to laughter, and the object of the laughter was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's what some of you do when I make a mistake, you laugh. So, but they laughed at him. Oh, Jesus, you, you surely you, you didn't mean what you said. And so what does Jesus do? He gets rid of the mourners. And, and it's interesting, when you look at this verse, uh, it says, putting them all out. Here's lowly, meek Jesus with, in the midst of all of these mourners professional and real mourner, and he puts them all out of the house. Get out! And it's reminiscent of when he went into the temple and cleansed the temple of the, the money changer. He, he has that kind of power. He has that kind of ability and authority. So here are these individuals who are weeping and mourning, but now laughing at him. Jesus puts them out. You are not fit to be witnesses to the miracle I'm about to do. And so after putting them out, it says at the end of verse 40, that the child's father and mother and his own companion entered the room where the child was. They go into the room where she lies dead. I've had that experience several times. In my ministry as a pastor and assistant pastor, I've gone into a room where the person was dead. The doctors weren't there. The nurses weren't there. I remember in a former church, there was a young man who was a sheriff, but he was, did security work uh, at a mall. And as he was in the back room, he was playing around with his gun. He wasn't trying to kill himself, but he ended up blowing his brains out. And I remember that Pastor Roberts had not arrived yet, so it fell on me. And I remember having to take his mother into the room. And there he was, dead. I remember when my mom, own mom died. I remember Marlene and myself and my sister going into the room, and there she lied, dead. So here is Jesus with the girl's mother and the girl's father, 
and his inner three disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they go into the room. She's dead. Maybe the sheet was pulled over her face. All of the life support equipment was turned off. She's dead. And that brings us to the last point, that the Lord over death gives death a deadly blow. The Lord over death kicks death's butt, if I can put it that way. The Lord over death gives death a knockout punch. The, the room that once was a hospice room is now going to become a hallelujah room. The room that once served as a funeral parlor will now be a praise parlor. How did it happen? Well, we read in verse 38 that the Lord Jesus Christ took the dead child by the hand. You see, Jairus had wanted the Lord to come and place his hands on the girl that she might not die. <laughs> Jesus grasped the girl's hand tenderly and affectionately so that she might live. He touched and grabbed her hand. He was not afraid to touch a dead corpse you see, in Israel's history, there were rules and regulations. You didn't touch people who were impure. And that's why it was shocking when Jesus healed the lepers, because lepers were not to be dealt with. You were to stay away from those who had leprosy. But he touched the leper and healed him. And so now here's this dead corpse against the Mosaic law. You, you don't touch the bodies of dead people. But Jesus takes her hand. Doesn't yank it, but tenderly takes her hand and then speaks to her in Aramaic. Says some words, we don't know what he's saying. But we're thankful that Mark knew that his readers wouldn't know either. Because his readers didn't know Aramaic, a language close to Hebrew. And so Mark interprets it for his readers. He says that what Jesus said to the dead girl is little girl. He addresses her and says directly to her, little girl, I say to you, and he issues a command, arise. That's all there is to it. He takes her hand, he speaks to her, he commands her to arise. <laughs> and the miracle is she arose from the dead. The text goes on to say that she arose and she started walking around. Isn't that wonderful? She didn't just get up a little bit and lean forward and say, oh, where am I? She got up, got out, and started walking around in the room. So, so, so they would know that this was no hallucination. This is no, well, maybe our body's just twitching. No, she got out of the bed and she was continually walking around. <laughs> and and it's, what's the response? The response of those is that they were completely astounded. They were utterly astounded. They were greatly astonished. They couldn't believe it. They marveled. They were amazed. They didn't run to the girl. They didn't say any. They just simply marveled and were in amazement at what they had been privileged to see. That this dead girl, who everybody knew was dead, she didn't go into a coma. She was dead. And everyone knew that. Jesus knew that. The parents knew that. The disciples knew that. The mourners knew that. 
The messenger knew that. She was dead. But he said to her, after taking her hand, arise. Rise up. And she immediately arose and began walking around. And they turned that room into an amazement room, an astonishment room. They marveled at the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus has to kind of bring them down from their high because they're in amazement. They're in astonishment. They are overwhelmed and totally amazed. And so he said, look, I need to give you a couple of responsibilities. I know you're excited. I know you're amazed. But he tells them, first of all, no one should know about this. <laughs> I don't know how you keep something like this quiet. <laughs> but he said, he gave them strict orders. And if you've been tracking through the gospel of Mark, many times Jesus had told individuals, don't say a word about what I've done. Now, to the man who possessed a legion of demons, he told him, go back to your home, tell your family what the great things the Lord has done for you. But here, Jesus said, I, I, I caused your daughter to rise from the dead. She's got life again. But don't tell no one. I'm commanding you, tell no one. And there's just something perplexing but very real in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus seems like he doesn't want to be an entertainment center. He doesn't want to be an amusement. He doesn't want people flocking to him and see him perform and do deeds. But he tells them. But of course, people are going to know. She's 12 years old. She's walking around. You can't hide that. But he gives him another responsibility. He tells them, give the girl something to eat. Now, isn't that strange? He just raised her from the dead. Couldn't he have raised her with a full stomach? She's been going through some hard time. Remember, she was on the verge of death. Probably didn't have a good appetite. Probably was hungry as she faced death. She didn't have the privilege of having Phyllis barbecue as she was dying. She's about ready to die. She's almost dead. And so as she's dying, her appetite leaves, etc. But once she's raised from the dead, she's raised from the dead as someone who's hungry, as someone who's a real human being. And Jesus says, give her something to eat. <laughs> well, who's laughing now? Remember, the mourners laughed at Jesus. What do you mean? Why this commotion? Why this weeping? Why are you uh, saying that she's not dead, but she's asleep? And they laughed at him. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. But Jesus laughs at death. He ridicules death. He taunts death. And Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, death, where is your sting? Because Jesus takes away the sting of death. But here is this marvelous miracle of Jesus raising Jairus' daughter from the dead. He's the Lord over death. And I'm so glad that he is. I'm so glad today that we can have full and firm confidence that Jesus is the Lord over death. I'm glad that he's the Lord over physical death. That he is able to raise a dead person, a person who is dead physically, a person who has no life no more, he is able to raise that dead person from the dead. He's able to do that physically, but I'm glad he's able to do that spiritually, that he's able to take those who are dead in trespasses and sins, 
those who don't have a relationship with the living God, those who come into this world as sinners, and the wrath of God abides upon them, who have no life, no relationship with God, that he's able to make the spiritually dead rise when they repent of their sins and when they put their faith in Jesus Christ. He gives them new life. And he says, in me, you are a new creature. You are a new creation. Walk in newness of life. Those who have experienced Jesus' lordship over spiritual death are promised to experience Jesus' lordship over physical death. I don't think you heard that. Those who have experienced new life in Christ, those who have been made alive spiritually, are promised Jesus' lordship over physical death. It doesn't mean that we won't experience death. We will. But the wonderful promise is that those who are in Christ, that one day Jesus Christ will come again. And the dead in Christ shall arise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And Paul goes on to say in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, so we shall be with him forever. That's the promise to those who have experienced Jesus' lordship over spiritual death in their life. They eventually will experience Jesus' lordship over their physical death. Until that time, make sure you learn from this man, Jairus, this synagogue official. Make sure that in times of crisis, you run to Jesus that you fall down before him and you tell him all about your problems. It's like the song we sing sometimes in prayer meetings, I must tell Jesus. <laughs> I must tell Jesus. It's him alone I must tell. And Jairus demonstrates that for us. I don't know his true spiritual... I just know that here was a man who ran to Jesus in times of crisis and genuine faith does that. Faith also obeys. Jesus said, quit being afraid, Jairus. Only believe. And he believed that. He obeyed that. And faith believes God. It obeys God. And then faith followed. This man followed. As Jesus went on to his own house and into his own daughter's room where she lied there, he went with Jesus every step of the way. And genuine faith does that. It goes with Jesus through all of the difficulties and hardships and good times of life. May your faith cause you to turn to Jesus no matter what the situation is. May your faith obey Jesus' will for your life. May your faith follow Jesus. Jesus Christ is indeed the Lord over death. He possesses authority and power over physical death and spiritual death. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for who he is, that he is the Lord over death that he has authority and a power over death itself. Thank you that he has the ability and the power to raise a physically dead person from the dead. But thank you even more so that he has the power to raise those who are spiritually dead from the dead and to give them new life and to enable them and to help them to walk in that new life. Thank you once again for our wonderful Savior, for our magnificent Savior, 
for the one who died for us and gave his life for us, that we might have eternal life. Thank you that Jesus is the Lord over death. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.